Good evening, I'm Katerina Georgieva. This is CBC Windsor News. Thanks for watching. Tonight, people can finally return home to an apartment building evacuated over safety concerns. Plus, people are fed up in Forest Glade. Hear the noise that's generating complaints to council. Farmers are demanding more support from the feds over tariffs supplied to fertilizer from Russia. And we'll tell you about holiday treats for those looking to sip on something non-alcoholic this season. People have now been allowed to return to 1616 Olette. It's taken nearly a month to happen. The apartment building was shut down in November because of safety concerns, displacing dozens. Jacob Parker joins me now live from outside the building. Jacob, what's happened to allow people to move back in? Well, as you can see, Katarina, the lights are back on here at 1616 Olette. And today we actually got to speak with ownership here at the building for the first time. One of the owners was here working, uh, hauling what he said was garbage uh, out of one of the sides of the building. And he told me that uh, they had uh, passed all of the uh, necessary fire inspections as well as doing the proper electrical upgrades uh, to get this building back into livable condition for the 10 here and that's something that we also did uh, confirm uh, with the city and uh, they were uh, people were allowed to come back here starting at around noon today we've seen a certain number of people uh, moving back in this evening as well hauling TVs and things like that uh, in through the front doors uh, over the course of this ordeal they have some have found new places to stay. others were put up at that emergency shelter uh, being put on by the Red Cross in the city um, the owner says there was a lot of work that went into getting this back into the condition that it's in to reopen and that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. We've already dumped probably God knows how much of just hazardous material and just things that shouldn't have been here. We've disinfected the whole building now. We've cleaning crews have gone in uh, multiple, multiple times. Um, and yeah, so we're hoping for the best going forward. Um, we know that people are, we're helping people come back in. Um, some of the elderly, of course, we're, we're making sure that they, they have all the assistance that they need. We're obviously changing if you guys want to look at the windows and get a shot of those. Um, they, need, they need to be changed as well. Those are coming in. Flooring's also coming in. Painters are coming in. Pest control's coming in. Um, everyone's trying their, their absolute best to make it a substantially better place. Now, Maholcha did tell me he bought this place just a couple of months ago with a partner. And at that time, all of the systems uh, seemed up to snuff that they were uh, good enough for people uh, to live in the live in the building. But over the course of 10 to 12 days, he says everything started to go sideways. Bygones are bygones. Um, we're past that now. We're happy the city came in, um, the MPP as well, and a, a couple of officials. and. They were happy with what the progress we've been making. We thought it was going to take a lot longer. Thank God it didn't. Um, but we're excited. Uh, we're ready. We're more than up to the task. I'm here um, almost at least a couple days of the week, on the weekends, of course, after, after work. And, um, and that's what we're looking forward to. We're trying to change the culture um, and, and build something substantial for the city of Windsor. Jacob, what does that mean for tenants? Well, one tenant I spoke with today said he couldn't get back in fast enough. He was really eager to be getting uh, back into his spot here. But there was another couple that I spoke with who were a little bit confused about just what was going on, uh, what the work was actually that was that had happened here uh, since they had moved out and were living in a motel. Um, but uh, MARTA management says that it, well, it had stepped in here as a crisis management team. Uh, they say of the 81 units that are in the building or that were occupied in the building, uh, only about 50 to 55 uh, of those residents have chosen to return. And um, the left wing of this building is actually uninhabitable. There is a total of 121 units that are able to be occupied, but the manager, or sorry, the owner said that that left wing is uh, really in bad shape. They were finding things like uh, human feces and drug paraphernalia on that side of the building amongst uh, the trash that they were bringing out there. Uh, so all in all, it's going to cost millions, uh, according to MARTA management, to get this building 
uh, back into the shape, uh, restore it to what it was saying was its former glory. I did ask the ownership about that as well, and they told me that right now their budget daily is changing. Okay. Thanks for this, Jacob. CBC's Jacob Barker live from outside 1616 Alette tonight. Construction on the new electric vehicle battery plant in Windsor's Forest Glade neighborhood has some nearby residents frustrated. A persistent banging from the site has community members asking for a change. CBC's Jennifer LaGrasse reports. Jerry Taylor took this video from his front yard today. He says it's been two months of this consistent noise, from 7 in the morning to 7 at night. Taylor turns on two radios to drown out the noise, but even that isn't enough. It's like two and a half blocks away from here, and it's, uh, when it's running, it's, it's so annoying. And like I say, after a while, it's, it's just like, it's on your nerves. You think you hear it, you know, even in the middle of the night sort of thing. Through the day, I wound up leaving the house because I just can't stand it anymore. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing out. <laughs> the source of the noise? Construction on Stellantis's new electric vehicle battery plant. It's called pile driving, when big metal rods are being hammered into the ground, creating a sort of ringing thud. Taylor says it's making him anxious, and he worries about how this might be impacting seniors or people on shift work. Ward Councillor Angelo Marignani says he's well aware of the noise. He hears it himself and has received more than 25 complaints. He says there's about 48 bangs per minute. Some residents, uh, there's a sincere concern. They have audio medical issues, and as a result, uh, it's almost maddening to hear this all throughout the day. People want jobs to come to Windsor, and this is part of having those jobs. And uh, with, with that growth, there is growing pains, and these are the short-term pains for that long-term gain. Uh, but at the same time, the quality of life of the people of East Riverside and Forest Glade has been degraded and we need to see whatever improvements we can do. Those improvements include bigger soil piles around the site to absorb the sound or changing the construction schedule to get more beams in at once and shorten the timeline on this part of the project. He says the city is looking at these options. For now, Marignani says the noise is expected to last until May or June of next year. It's understandable. I mean, it's very important to us, but at what cost? Jennifer LaGrasa, CBC News, Windsor. Migrant advocacy groups are calling on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to honour his word and ensure permanent residency status for all migrants. It's something the Prime Minister committed to in a mandate letter one year ago today. If you don't have permanent resident status, whether you are on a study permit, a work permit, or you're completely undocumented, you are denied the most basic services that you need to survive. Uh, people are denied life-saving health care, are exploited and abused at work, and cannot stand up for their rights, even if they have rights. Uh, you are separated from your family, and you live in daily fear of being ripped apart from your community. The group rallied outside federal public safety minister Marco Mendicino's office in Scarborough this morning. They're also calling for the cancellation of deportations of a Ugandan refugee and single mother, as well as an international student. Fatima Najuma and her three-year-old daughter, who was born in Canada, could be forced to leave the country after border services issued a removal order. Abu Hina Mostafa Kamal is an international student facing deportation because he could not pay high tuition fees. The migrant rights Network says these are just two cases of the dozens of people who are deported each day. The cost of war in Ukraine has been felt here in Essex County. Farmers have watched the price of fertilizer skyrocket. When this first started, Canada put a 35 percent tax on nearly all Russian imports. That includes the nitrogen fertilizer from Russia that farmers in Ontario use to boost crops. Earlier this week, Finance Minister Christia Freeland announced revenue from that tax on Russian and Belarusian imports would go to Ukraine. It would be used to repair Kyiv's power grid. That's roughly $115 million. Nearly a third of that was paid by Canadian farmers importing Russian fertilizer. Joining me for more on this is Drew Spolstra, the Vice President of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. Thanks for doing this, Drew. Thanks for having me. What was your reaction when you learned that the money from the fertilizer tariff was going to go towards rebuilding Ukrainian power grid infrastructure? 
Well, obviously, supporting uh, you know Ukraine in their uh, their efforts is an important part of uh, what we do as Canadians, and and uh, you know what we can do as well as farmers in Canada. But we've got concerns, obviously, around the tariff and uh, you know how that money is is distributed. We'd like that money to come back to agriculture. Uh, farmers have paid uh, you know close to thirty five million dollars. Uh, Ontario farmers, Eastern Canadian farmers, have paid that money uh, into the government coffers. Uh, it hasn't done anything to uh, affect things in Russia, and we'd like to get that money back to the agriculture industry here at home. Yeah, can you paint a picture of how bad this has been for farmers, specifically for those here in Windsor-Essex? Well, it's concerning. I mean, when, uh, when we've placed this tariff on Russian fertilizer, it's, uh, it's really distorted the fertilizer market. The prices uh, you know, that we're having to pay have uh, really inflated over the last, uh, over the last year. Um, we're seeing a lot of concerns with cost of production for farmers on the ground, and it's, it, it's increasing food prices as well. And we don't want to see that continue. Uh, we want to make sure that farmers uh, can continue to be profitable, but, you know, see a, a reduced cost in their fertilizer inputs as well. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can look at things like removing that tariff, but sourcing our fertilizer in other sustainable ways uh, that, that don't inflate and distort the market going forward. Uh, can you expand on that? Well, you know, there's two real asks of the government here, and the first is obviously to return that funding um, to farmers in Ontario, to farmers in eastern Canada, and the other one is to remove that tariff. Um, you know, there's lots of other places that we can buy fertilizer from. We actually produce quite a bit of fertilizer here in Canada. Our biggest challenge is, uh, is just distributing that from western Canada to eastern Canada uh, because the, the rail network, and that is our, our only real source of moving that uh, fertilizer across the country. And it doesn't have the capacity to move as much as we need. So we end up uh, shipping a lot of our fertilizer in from other parts of the world. And if we can find better ways to, uh, to get that fertilizer here and utilize other sources other than Russia, I think there's uh, lots of opportunities there. Right. And you said that you want to see more of that money go back into agriculture as well. So what specifically do you want to see from the federal government? Well, uh, you know, we, we need to find ways to return that money that, to agriculture. They have said and been clear that they're not going to write checks directly to farmers that paid the tariff. Uh, obviously, that's that would be option one. But, uh, you know, there are other ways to try and get that money back to farmers as well through different types of programming that already exist within uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada um, and, and other networks that they can funnel that money back to farmers uh, that have in, been impacted by the tariff. It's not just farmers that have paid the tariff that are impacted. Every fer Every fertilizer user Every farmer that uses fertilizer uh, is seeing an increased cost in their production, an increased cost in their fertilizer because of the Russian tariff. So, um, you know, we need to see that eliminated. We need, to, we need to see some money back to farmers on the ground. Thanks so much for talking us through this. Thanks for having me. Drew Spolstra is the Vice President of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. Ukraine continues to weather missile strikes from Russia today. A Kiev resident trying to lift spirits by leading a rendition of Ukrainian folk songs on a subway platform where people were taking shelter underground. <laughs> It didn't take long for others to join in the impromptu sing-along, and some even took a spin across the makeshift dance floor as they waited out the airstrikes above ground. Let's take a live look outside at our city there. we got a chance of flurries in the days to come. Dahlia Asher will be here after the break with more.
spend. It is holiday party time. That might mean a trip out to a restaurant with colleagues or a night in with family and friends. It might also include cocktails, but that drink doesn't need to include alcohol. Windsor Mornings Nav Nanwa popped by Maiden Lane Wine and Spirits to learn how to make a mocktail. The easy one for people at home is probably a apple ginger mule. So if you could pick yourself up some decent cider from the grocery store, uh, ginger beer and lime, you can start there, go about four ounces of cider, uh, a little bit of fresh lime, and grate some fresh nutmeg and cinnamon on there, top up with ginger beer, and you got, and got a great drink. So we got some house-made cider here, but it's gonna be the same, right? Just your cold plus apple juice, some warm cinnamon, allspice, clove. I'm gonna start with four ounces of that. Again, I've never been behind a bar before, so this is all <laughs> really cool. <laughs> Forgive my nerves, but it's nice to have someone back here. Did you hear? A little fresh lime here. Oh, I apologize. Up. Yes. So then we'll top with some ice. This could also be served warm, mind you. Mm. Whatever you prefer. Gosling's. We'll toss a little Gosling's ginger beer. Grate a little fresh nutmeg on there. Microplane. fresh cinnamon. And like, how do you decide what to use as a little bit of a finisher? The garnish, I mean, it's something that you want to enhance. Oftentimes it can be something to drink, or sorry, rather to eat, something to enhance the experience, but more about aromatics, I think, than vision. A lot of people like a pretty garnish. I think we want more practical things that are gonna maybe add something to the scent and to, to, the, to the taste. I'll take a sip. Oh man, that is unreal. It's so refreshing. <laughs> Has a little bit of that sort of winter-esque vibe to it with the nutmeg and the cinnamon. Feel very seasonal based yeah. on the fact that we're in the holiday season, but I also feel like I can enjoy this like on a beach. Dahlia Ashri joins us now for a look at our weather forecast. Dahlia, what's on the go as we look into the weekend? Well, besides cocktails and mocktails that you can have <laughs> indoors uh, when, the wind, when the weather is getting a little chillier, uh, really just uh, making sure that you enjoy the weekend. There's a little bit of flurries in sight. Bundle up as usual. I mean, like I said yesterday, and I'll repeat it again today, weather doesn't, uh, winter doesn't officially hit until Wednesday. So really, we have a little bit of time to enjoy it. However, we are expecting some chilly nights ahead. Now, uh, today we are sitting above seasonal temperatures. Look at that. Usually the normal high is one degree. The daytime high today, two degrees. The normal low is usually minus six and today it's zero. So still pretty mild temperatures compared to what we would usually anticipate and have this time of year. Uh, so you can either head outdoors for the weekend or stay indoors if uh, you find that too chilly, like I was saying earlier. Uh, it is one degree currently in uh, Windsor, a little cooler in certain areas like Godrich, uh, London, zero degrees. Now in Ottawa, which is all way out east uh, we're seeing that they have a snowfall warning so if you're planning on heading out there you just got to be aware of that uh, southwestern Ontario starting to see a little bit of flurries tonight heading into tomorrow as well a little bit of sunshine on the way uh, but you know what listen it's still a little bit of white here that means traces of snow which really is flurries uh, compared to if we look out here in Ottawa that heavy blue which means there is that snowfall warning so really southwestern Ontario here is seeing most of that white, which means traces of flurries. That is what to expect heading into tomorrow, and that will carry through into Sunday as well. Uh, really cooler temperatures tonight. We're going to see that it will dip. However, we're also seeing that it will be quite windy. Winds will be gusting up to 40 kilometers an hour, so that's today. Heading into tomorrow, we're going to see that it will start to cool down or lighten up just a little bit, and then it will pick up again. Winds will be 39 kilometers an hour as we head into Sunday morning, and then as we head into Sunday night, and Monday, uh, we're going to start seeing that it will lighten up that wind, but really throughout the weekend, we're going to see strong winds gusting. Tonight, temperatures will drop in Windsor, a low minus three, some flurries in sight, uh, and that will carry through all across southwestern Ontario. And then look at that, a little bit of sunshine. Don't let it fool you because that wind chill kicks in and it feels more like minus two throughout the week. Thank you so much for that, Delia. Thanks, Katerina. When we come back, Josiah Sinanen joins us to tell us about his conversation with Sapphire and her book brought up during a tense public school board meeting. Stay with us.
Earlier this month, we told you about a debate-filled meeting of the English Public School Board. A trustee wanted new books added to the board's library collection posted on a website for parents to scrutinize. And that started a conversation about the kinds of books kids can access. Now, for more, I want to bring in Afternoon Drive's Josiah Sinanen now. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. I know that you actually spoke with one of the authors of one of the books that were discussed that day. Yeah, so one of the books mentioned at that meeting was Push by Sapphire. And anytime there's a concern for available literature, especially in an educational setting, it usually does become that larger discussion about censorship and transparency. So as I mentioned, Push was one of those books brought up by a concerned parent, and she called it, quote, the most disgusting book I've ever read at the school board meeting. The book, of course, if you haven't heard of it, was the inspiration for the 2009 movie Precious, and it deals with some heavy taboos, incest, sexual violence, and raw discussions on HIV. So although the book was published 26 years ago, it was recently banned just this year at a Utah school board. So I reached out to Sapphire at her apartment in Brooklyn to share the comment that was made here in Windsor, and here was her reaction to that. It's like a, a fever. It come. It keeps coming back, like long COVID or something like that. You think it's gone, and then it's 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 back on you. But we're in a you know a really troubled time, at least in the United States. And there's a deep desire uh, when people talk about getting back to normal. They talk. They're they're really talking about going back to the 1950s or something like that. A, a time when a boy was a boy and a girl was a girl, and you know, and and there and uh, people lived, uh, people who were different lived, lived deep inside of a closet. I wrote wow. something that made, a, humanized the character with AIDS. And to me, that was like getting the Nobel Prize or something. So that that's how I look at it. You know, little ways, big ways, uh, you know, changing people's hearts, you know, and, and you know, we, we can change the laws, but as long as people are hating homosexuals, as long as people are lining up at the border to send the black and brown back home and beat them with whips and all that, uh, we still have a we still have an issue, you know. And I just feel like literature is not the total answer, but it is part of the answer. Yeah, really inspirational words there from Sapphire. And she also shared with me that the book wasn't written with North American schools in mind, but that it became that way because kids got their hands on the book regardless. And that opened a larger discussion. We also spoke with U Windsor education professor Lana Parker on Afternoon Drive about how kids today have access to all this material outside of an educational setting. So having those discussions at schools can be very beneficial with the teacher's guidance and having that transparency in place. And Kat, I should add there is an online portal where anyone can find school libraries offerings for the public board and that parents will typically be warned in advance if harder conversations will come up in that setting to prepare for those conversations. So you can listen to my full interview with Sapphire and our chat with Lana Parker on the CBC Listen app by looking up Afternoon Drive. Thanks so much for that, Josiah. Thank you, Kat. CBC's Josiah Sinanen. Our Sounds of the Season campaign continues, the donations pouring in, everything of course going to the Windsor-Essex Food Bank Association. And earlier today, I spoke with one of our longtime partners with the Windsor-Essex County Canoe Club. So Kevin, you just showed up to the CBC building with a big haul. Tell us what you brought. Wow. So the Windsor-Essex County Canoe Club uh, put together our food donations and cash donations that we've collected at our recent events. Um, we've been doing this, I don't know, since 2013, I think it was, we started. So. Amazing. And how much were you able to collect this year just for Sons of the Season? Just over $800 this year. So. That's amazing. For a small club, yeah, it's fun. And you've been doing this for many years. Why do you keep doing this? It's a good way to keep uh, involved in the community, and there's no friendlier people than paddlers, so we, we like to give back. And how important is it this time of year just to sort of see the community in general coming together for things like this? The past couple of years have been isolating for all of us. So it's great to get back together and uh, you know, do something worthwhile together again. It's good for the morale and good for the soul, I think. We are still accepting donations for our Sounds of the Season campaign until the end of the month. So for all the information that you need in order to do that, go to cbc.ca slash Windsor. That is it for CBC Windsor News. Thanks so much for watching and have a great night.